Morning. Art Hostage here and we're going to do another episode. Well, I popped back again because there's a couple of little stories I wanted to bring to you. But first of all, I just want to pose a question. It's now my public knowledge that the IRA gave Salman Rushdie a pass and supported him because of his support against Section 31 censoring Sinn Féin. And Bono gave refuge to Salman Rushdie at his house for five years. On the opposite side of the equation, we got the Kinahan cartel, Christy Senior, Daniel Kinahan and Christopher Junior Kinahan. Okay. They have worked with the Iranian regime, the government, and they provided their hitman, whether it was Arakas or not, I'm not sure, but they murdered an Iranian dissident who was living in the Netherlands. Murder for hire. And this person was speaking out against the Iranian regime, the government, and the Kinahans were employed by the Iranian government to murder this outsp outspoken critic of the Iranian government. I can go back and get the case for you, and we might cover it in, a, in future episodes. So it seems that the Kinahans are on the wrong side of world opinion now. And it will also come out further once OFAC, right, the um, investigations are, are completed. It will come out that the Kinahans have been dealing with Hezbollah, the terrorist group. Hamas, the terrorist group, and all other terrorist groups laundering their money and doing goodness knows what else, but because, you know, that hasn't been made public. Any, you know, how many other dissidents of regimes like the Iranians or, you know, Hezbollah and all these people, right, have the Kinahans killed, murder for hire? How much money have they laundered? How much arms smuggling have they got into, providing weapons for Hamas in the Gaza Strip? for Hezbollah in Lebanon during the Syria conflict. Whose side were the Kinahans on? Did they help the uh, terrorists in Syria? Or were they on the side of the Syrian government, Assad? You see, these are all big geopolitical questions, okay? And there is some kind of linkage with the Kinahan cartel to all of them. So then when we step back and we say, well, we want to find out about the Kinahans and Daniel Kinahan's involvement in boxing and the fraud that was committed in the Wilder Fury fights, the money laundering, the Bud Crawford thing, and all of those things which are noble and honourable questions to ask. But when you put it in the bigger picture, you can see that this goes so deep and so broad and wide that people can almost get lost in all of this. So we need to compartmentalise it all. We need to put it in compartments. This is the Kinahan's connection to boxing and what they've done to boxing and how they can destroy boxing and how um, their connections can bring down the whole of boxing and inquire on that. And then the next one is, what's the Kinahan's connection to the Iranian government and murder for hire? and to Hezbollah, and to Hamas, and to maybe Al-Qaeda, and what was them other ones? I mean, they, they changed their names, right? Like, we change our underwear. And so you put that in the terrorism box, and then you got another box about the international drug dealing, and the movement of drugs, and how they've corrupted Business, aviation businesses, you know, other businesses that they've corrupted. So once you put it into compartments, it's easier to break down and actually, you know, understand it more. If you've got a particular interest in boxing, you can look at the boxing compartment and the Kinahan connection. If you've got a particular interest in geopolitical things, well, you've got the box, the Kinahan cartel box with 
terrorism and connections to Iran and to Hezbollah and Hamas. And then if you've got connections, you, uh, sorry, if you've got an interest in drug cartels and how they work, you've got that box, the Kenahan cartel, drug cartel, everyday business. And then you might look at Russia and the Russian connections. And that's another box. And that's the only way that I can sort of deal with this because this is so huge, you know, um, that I think everyone's underestimated. And everyone's saying the authorities are taking their time and there are reasons for that. Of course there are. But maybe one of the reasons is just the, the, the magnitude of this whole investigation into the Kinahans. And maybe we've underestimated just how broad and wide and how huge this is. But I think we got a taste of it when there is this list, which they announced in public, of 600 people that are banned from entering the US. I mean, that, I think that gives us some idea of the scope and the magnitude of this thing when it actually finally bursts open. So anyway, right, we move on now because there's a couple of stories I want to bring you. We got the um, we got a man here, char man charged with cannabis worth four three hundred ninety eight thousand euros seized in Galway bust. A man has been charged after Gardy found almost four hundred thousand euros worth of cannabis in a Galway house on Saturday. Gardy obtained a Section 26 warrant under the Misuse of Drugs Act 1977 and carried out a search at the home in Anna, Anna, Anna Down, Galloway yesterday afternoon. During the search, which was conducted as part of Operation Tara, they seized cannabis plants and cannabis herb with an estimated combined street value of €398,400. The man was arrested at the scene and taken to Galway Garda Station where he was detained under Section 2 of the Criminal Justice Drug Trafficking Act 1996. The man has since been charged and was due to appear before a special sitting of Galway District Court this morning, Sunday, August the 14th at 10am. The seized drugs will now be sent for further analysis. Investigations are ongoing. The seized drugs will now be sent for further analysis before being handed back to friendly drug gangs that are friendly with the Guardi. I mean, how many times does that happen? They seize the drugs, right? You know what I mean? When they seize 100 kilos of cocaine, when it gets back to the Guardi station, right, they write it in as uh, 86 kilos, right? Then when they charge the people that they seized it off, they say, you're charged with having 48 kilos of cocaine, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I go, well, where's the rest? And oh, that's been given to your rivals because they cooperate with the Guardi and we work together. Oh, really? Do you? Yeah. We use all sorts to get drugs into the country. Rural aerodromes. Oh, God, yeah. Longford aerodrome. Yeah. Edward McGooey. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Yeah, runs for the hare, hunts for the hounds. You know what I mean? It's a sewer, a rotten sewer. But within the Guardi, there are some actual people who are not uh, corrupt. Lots of them are not corrupt and are actually trying to fight this. But those who are corrupt and who ha work hand in glove with the drug gangs and criminality in general, organised crime, okay, they hold a lot of power. And then they've got their political connections. But every now and again, what happens is... Um, a few little scandals happen and they have to cover it up and then the media go out and start producing positive stories about the Guardi to lessen the damage done. But I tell you what we could see, when when the Americans finally present their case against the uh, Kinahans, we could see a lot of Guardi officers being arrested for corruption and collusion. And that's something, obviously, that the Irish government and the Guardi are worried about is what will the Americans discover and what will they be made public and how will that car will that cast a, a dark shadow over the Guardi 
And will that cast a dark shadow over the current Irish government? Fina Foyle, Fina Gale. And there'd be a huge mess made, okay? And then when Sinn Féin get power, or they take, they take power, they've got to clear up the mess. And Fina Foyle and Fina Gale will probably leave a message for Sinn Féin, right, as they take power. Sorry to say, all the money's gone. The whole country is now going to collapse and you're going to get the blame. So anyway, we move on, right? We got, we're going to move into the boxing now. Tyson Fury has until August the 26th to confirm his retirement as the WBC set their heavyweight champion a deadline before his title is vacated. After the Gypsy King announced he is hanging up his gloves for a set second time on his 34th birthday. The WBC have given Tyson Fury until August the 26th to confirm his plans to retire. They will not vacate his heavyweight champion belt until after the deadline. Fury retired on his 34th birthday and has already vacated his Ring Magazine belt. Right, well this is all nonsense, right? It doesn't mean anything. Because what we got to do is wait until after the AJ Usyk fight, which is next Saturday. Okay, this coming Saturday. It's Sunday now, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's the AJ Usyk fight. And once that fight has taken place, that's the 20th. Okay, before the um, 26th of August, right, mark my words... Tyson Fury will announce that he's not retired and he's coming out of retirement. Or, we then start going into the Kinahan stuff and why Tyson Fury's not allowed into the US. And the other Fury, the young one, Tommy Fury, forget about John and Peter Fury, they'll never be allowed in the US because of their previous convictions. Drug dealing and money laundering for Peter Fury and thuggish antisocial scumbag gouging out of a man's eye by John Fury, so that you can forget them, dregs of society, they, they, they will never be allowed in the US. But when this comes to a head, there's going to be a lot of questions to answer. And as I say, you know, and I said it a long time ago, the biggest fight of Tyson, Fury, Tyson Fury's life, right, may not be in the boxing ring. It might be in a courtroom, in a court of law. You know, and he's got to face the stark choice, Tyson Fury. If he wants to continue with his career, if he wants to do any more fighting, well, he's going to have to cooperate with authorities. If he doesn't cooperate with authorities, his career is completely over. It's finished. Plus the fact he's, he will have to face any questions authorities have with his connections to the Kinahan cartel that go back decades. But if he does cooperate with authorities, he's got to face the wrath of the Kennehan cartel, but also those in the criminal world, okay, the underworld, right, and all the majority of a lot of the supporters of Tyson Fury who are ex-criminals or criminally motivated or antisocial, you know, uneducated, aggressive. You know, he's got supporters across the board. But if he was to cooperate with authorities, he would lose a lot of his support, although he would then gain a lot more support from legitimate people, the majority. Because when Tyson Fury was nominated for the BBC personality, Sports Personality of the Year, 140,000 people wrote to the BBC and said he is not appropriate for that title, meaning his criminality, meaning he's meaning he's dishonest nature. He's certainly not a role model. But he's cultivated this gangster kind of aura around him, and then all the wannabe gangsters want to hang around Tyson Fury. But what he forgets is the vast majority of people are not like that. And if Tyson Fury was to cooperate with authorities, he would then be looked more in a positive light. So he's got some decisions to make. And as we noticed, when he retired on his 34th birthday, he didn't give a shout-out or a thank-you to Peter Fury, his uncle, 
who in actual fact it can be argued actually made Tyson Fury what he is today. You know, Peter Fury's a much, much better experienced, talented boxing trainer than John Fury will ever be. I mean, John Fury at the best estimate really is a sort of local club boxing trainer. That's about it as far as his abilities go. But Peter Fury, regardless of his past, regardless of what he's involved in, you know, and regards the underworld and everything, you know, he genuinely does have a talent for being a boxing trainer, you know, over decades in that respect. But Tyson Fury, you know, and John Fury and Peter Fury are at war. There's no love lost. And so the question is, I like to ask the question, why? And who has now just come on board with Peter Fury, right? But Peter Clark, right? A top drug dealer, gangster from Liverpool. And who's just appeared, okay, out of the shadows, okay? Homer Simpson. No, 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 not Homer Simpson. Carl Wall. Now, he's a serious person. Okay, the ex-boxer. He, right, could have had a huge, well-titled, well-champion career. And he got to the crossroads, or he could become an international drug dealer and gangster. And he and that's a, and that's the path he, tro uh, he chose. Sorry. And he's now out. He got sentenced to 21 years in 2014. So eight years later, he's out. And he might be on day release, week release, or or home release and all this sort of carry on, but he's out and about now. There's a photograph yesterday with it of him with Billy Moore. And I went down to look at his podcast, not bad, do you know what I mean? I don't mind listening to him. And then someone has said John Hass is out. Is that, uh, um, yeah, he's, he's another heavy duty, a mover and shaker. I don't know um, what he got um, sentenced to. I'm just going to have a look now. Because as we're getting more people being released, drug lord John Hash has been released from prison. Well, that was 2020. Oh, dear. Well, let's go back then. Let's have a look then. See, I like doing this live. John Hash criminal. He's got a Wikipedia page. That ain't bad then, is it? Born 1948. John Hass and his nephew Paul Bennett are career criminals with convictions for bank robbery and drug smuggling. In 1996, Hass and Bennett were given a royal pardon 11 min months into an 18-month prison sentence for heroin smuggling, having provided information leading to the seizure of firearms. The Home Secretary, Michael Howard, was criticised for the decision and in 2008, Hash and Bennett were convicted of having set up the weapons fine to earn their release and sentenced to 20 and 22 years in prison. So that was in 2008. Oh, this is a good one. I'm going to have a look at this. Oh, dear. There was two people that were sent um, a sentence. Oh, hello. So they got captured with drugs. So then they cooperated, right, as informants to say that there was a load of weapons. The police go and discover the weapons and then they get a royal pardon for doing that. But really, it's found out that they set up the weapons in the first place. Oh, I'm going to have to read about that one. Hassan Bennett. That's, a, that's quite a good one, isn't it? We'll have to go. We'll have to go and do that. Let's, when was he released then? Twenty twenty. Drug lord John Hash has been released from prison and is back in Liverpool. Eighteenth of January, twenty twenty. So that's over two years ago. Was he been jailed and back out again? But you see. Oh, this is a good one, isn't it? I like this. Yeah, well, I'm gonna, I will do another episode on him because I think we've... Um, how long we gone on here? We're at 19 minutes, okay? And so we're, what we're going to do is we'll do another episode on um, John Hass and the Paul Bennett case with the weapons. And, yeah, and the Home Secretary, Michael Howard. And I think when he ran for the... When he was a leader of the Conservative Party, that came up. That's going to be a good one, isn't it? I forgot about that. I remember it at the time. 
and it just didn't resonate with me because I weren't investigating it as much as this. And what we finish off for this episode with is a bit of stolen art, right? You know what I mean? Just to keep it going, right? Stolen Picasso found in Dialia, says Iraqi Minister of Interior. Well, be careful, right? I mean, people have sent me photographs of stolen Picassos from Kuwait, Iraq, and all that over the years, but most of them are just copies, right? Okay, so we just get that right. A drug gang was arrested on Saturday, right? Hang on, let's have a look here. Right. In Baghdad, right, a drug gang was arrested on Saturday with the possession of a stolen painting by the well-known artist Picasso, valued by millions of dollars, according to the General Directorate for Combating Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances in the Ministry of the Interior. Fuck me, that's some long handle, isn't it, eh? That is some long handle, isn't it, eh? General Directorate for Combating Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances in the Ministry of Interior. God, you'd have to have a long card for that, wouldn't you? The Ministry, that sounds better, doesn't it? That's what I'm going to call them now, the Ministry. The Ministry announced that, that this came as one of the outcome of its security operations during July, indicating the importance of the citizen role to report drug gangs in order to eliminate them and prevent the spread of narcotics that result in so societal crimes. Well, like we didn't know that. The General Directorate of Narcotics Control relies on intelligence information and in cooperation with the rest of the security services, including the intelligence agency, the, Nas um, the National Security Agency and the Intelligence Service said the Director of Anti-Narcotics Media Office, Colonel Bilal Sobi, to the Iraq news agents, Iraqi news agency, INA. He highlighted saying our work depends on the intelligence information provided by the citizens as the latter plays a large and important role in dismantling many drug networks. By calling the direct, directorate's toll-free hotline number 178, which works in all, go, gov, government, uh, all parts of the Iraqi government in Iraq, as well as by reporting via the website of the Narcotics Control Facebook, in addition to the raids and monitoring by our detachments around places where young people gather. Sobe explained our detachment our detachment carries out periodic K9 inspections in cafes. The work is ongoing and intensive to curb the trade, promotion and use of drugs. He pointed out that a number of the arrested drug dealers, promoters, distributors and users for July amounted to 1,300 suspects, in addition to seizing 45 kilograms of narcotics as well as 37 kilograms of stimulants, including crystal. Noting this statistic is the outcome of the director's operations thus far. The drug trade is linked to many other crimes, including murder, theft, kidnapping, rape, gang formation, corruption, and family disintegration until it reaches the antiquities trade, he noted. Sobe stressed that the anti-narcotics directorate carried out an operation in Diliar Governorate in which a network of three defendants who were involved in the trade and transport of narcotic drugs were arrested and a painting belonging to the international painter Picasso was seized in their possession. Estimated millions of dollars. It is a major operation that is calculated for the anti-drugs general directorate. Well, It'll be interesting to see about this Picasso because, as I say, there's a lot of fake ones that have been floating around the underworld. So, anyway, this is going to be episode 296. Okay. We flushed out um, a little bit more on the Liverpool drug scene. We've had a look at the Kinahans and there's a stolen painting out there that's been recovered, a Picasso, which I'm a bit sceptical on. Right, so this is going to be Art Hostage, episode 296. Okay, the show goes on. Art Hostage, signing off.